Well, hi there. A few years ago, really before most of you'd ever heard of Clint's reptiles or even snake discovery, Emily and I got together to make a list of five more of the best pet snakes. Of course, you made me crickets first. But then we got to talk about five really, really amazing pet snakes. And on that list were rosy boas, the snake I have loved since I was a kid. Growing up as an only child without any handheld electronic devices and blessed with biannual road trips across the state of Kansas, this book, the National Audubon Society Field Guide to North American Reptiles and Amphibians, was one of my very best friends. We'll have a link to it in the description in case you're looking for a friend. I still remember my excitement upon discovering that on page 508, somewhere in the North American desert, which is where I lived, there existed a real live boa. Not only do we have a native boa, but it is one of the most beautiful boas I have ever seen. Many of them, in fact, the one in my field guide looked a lot like this one. It has stripes of gray and kind of a pinkish orange that run the length of its body. And though it's similarly sized to the Kenyan sand boa, which is also beautifully colored, it has a more typical boa head. And I love the boa head. It was out there somewhere. Since this time, I have found many rubber boas, which are the other North American boa. However, I have still never seen a rosy boa in the wild, but it still makes me happy to know they're out there and that they aren't so far away. And I get really excited each time I get to interact with them. I've become particularly enamored with the Mexican locality, as I like the high contrast with the black and cream, which is arguably more beautiful than the more familiar kind of strawberries and cream or oranges and cream sort of dream sickle coloration of many of the other rosy boas. I almost bought one a little while back, but I wasn't yet convinced that it was the snake for me. I'd heard one thing about their care that concerned me a bit, and I knew I needed to do more research before I'd be able to make an informed decision. Fortunately, I recently met Matt Jepson when he allowed us to film his son's amazing arowana and freshwater stingray. Unbeknownst to me, but notes to him, there was an incredible selection of other amazing animals that they keep and breed like basilisks, all sorts of exotic moths, and a huge assortment of rosy boas. Bonus points if you caught that one, by the way. But Matt has been kind enough to bring a selection of his rosy boas here to Clint's Reptile Room so I can answer the question, is the rosy boa a good pet? And is it the best pet snake for you? In order to sort this out, I'm gonna need a hand because we are going to score the rosy boa based on our five categories, which are handleability, care, hardiness, availability, and upfront costs. When it comes to handleability, we give the rosy boa a score of five out of five. I was gonna say four out of five, and I was gonna say four out of five because some of them can be bitey. Uh, I've definitely encountered bitey rosy boas before, and it definitely seems to be something that's largely tied to their feeding response. Being boas, they eat like boas, and sometimes they're not that discriminating. But the thing is, the bite is no big deal. Uh, this snake poses absolutely no danger at all to humans. And other than the possibility of getting one with a really powerful feeding response, which not, I mean, they all like to eat, but not all of them are gonna bite you like that. The only other downside is that, you know, like anything, it might poop on you. But if you know how to recognize a snake that has one on deck, this really shouldn't be much of an issue. Other than that, it doesn't get any better than this. They're about perfect to handle. And so I think assuming you don't get one that happens to be a bitey individual, this snake deserves a perfect score for handleability. They're not too big where they can be difficult to manage, not at all, but they're a robust snake for being a snake this small. And you know, they're big enough that they're not gonna be easily injured or lost while handling them. And that's a big bonus. They don't drop their tails. And though they have some tiny little legs with claws, those claws are far too small to do any damage. They're not gonna scratch you. They're also one of those few relatively small snakes that tend to be slow and deliberate in their movements instead of quick and darty. You might notice, 
I'm not even looking at the three rosy boas that I'm handling simultaneously right now. They are so easy to manage, so slow and deliberate and just pleasant. They're, they're like handling a giant snake, except they're not giant snakes. And so if your snake isn't a bitey one and you know how to avoid the occasional snake poop, handling a rosy boa is as easy to do as is possible with a snake or really any other kind of reptile for that matter. When it comes to care, I give the rosy boa a score of four out of five. Care is actually fairly normal for a snake with one possible exception. As with pretty much every snake, you need an enclosure that leaves no way for an athletic tiny hose to poke its head out. I did recently do a live face-to-face -face virtual tour in the room here with some people that had just lost their pet snake a few days before. And happily, in the first few minutes of our visit, we were able to find their pet snake. You just have to think like a snake. But what's even better is to prevent the snake from escaping in the first place. So good lids and enclosure doors are a must with really any snake, and this is no exception. The enclosure for these guys doesn't need to be excessively large, as they're not excessively large and they're not very active either. Do make sure that the enclosure favors ground space over vertical space and ensure that they can get far away from their basking spot. These guys prefer temperatures considerably cooler than do most tropical snakes. For this reason, be sure that your warm side is on a thermostat as they don't endure extreme heat very well at all. For heat, you can use heat tape, heat pads, radiant heat. It just needs to be something that'll get their temperature up. And then keep the enclosure in a cooler part of your home as the cold side of the enclosure needs to be a bit cooler than many people's homes. But sometimes it may need to get much cooler still. And we'll discuss that in just a moment. For now, let's talk food. They like food. They are boas and they will eat. They'll eat probably about every time you try to feed them. So keep that in mind that you don't want them to become obese. For the most part, they're gonna eat whole prey like rodents, though they will possibly take other vertebrates as well. They seem to do really well on an all rodent diet. Most of them will do well on frozen thawed because they like to eat and so that's absolutely delightful. They don't need to be fed as often as many snakes because they've got relatively slow metabolisms. That's fairly common for boas generally, and this is a fairly cool temperature boa. One thing is, and there seems to be some debate on this, so take this with a grain of salt, but during a few months of the year, you shouldn't be feeding them at all. And that's because they should be roommating. This means that you may need to have like a cold storage or a wine chiller where you can cool them for a few months each year. This is definitely important if you intend to breed them. They're not gonna cycle properly, they're not gonna breed if you don't cool them for a few months each year. But it also may have an impact on their lifespans as well. The jury seems to be out on that, but I've definitely read that for many, many years from many people, and then other people say they've kept their snakes for a really long time, because this is actually a very long-lived snake, for a really long time, never brumating them, they did fine. But this, this thing that, again, I'm still trying to figure out. Do they really need to be cooled down like this or do they only need that if you're gonna breed them? And so this, it has been my biggest reservation when it comes to getting a rosy boa. I do wanna take just a moment to point out one more thing with regard to care, which is humidity. It's not that difficult because we're here in the desert, but if you're in a place where it is fairly humid, Keeping the tank nice and dry, which is what they need, will help you prevent some potential health issues you could have like respiratory infections. Just limit how much, like how large of a water bowl that you have, and just try to keep it as dry as you can in their enclosure. When it comes to hardiness, we give the rosy boa a score of five out of five. This is a very long-lived snake. You know, if you just provide them with reasonably good care, possibly cooling them, annually, but again, the jury's sort of out on that one. They can live for a really, really long time, like more than 30 years, not uncommon at all. And, and when you think about it, people that have been keeping snakes for 30 years, like they were starting to do this a long time ago before the hobby had come along as far as it has now. And they were still having success with these snakes for decades and decades. When it comes to availability, we give the rosy boa a score of three out of five. They're out there. Okay, they're totally out there. You'll see them at expos. You'll occasionally see them in pet shops, but online directly from a breeder like Matt Jepson, who actually 
brought all of these incredible snakes with him today, that's your best bet. And Matt keeps and breeds the most localities of rosy boas of anyone I know. And so I wanted to introduce you to him so he could show us some of the localities that he's brought with him today. So as you can imagine, I love rosy boas. I've always considered myself mostly a field guy. I love to be out in the field. I love to see these animals and all other kinds of herps in their natural environment. But a few have a special place in my heart and have led me, especially right now when I've got some boys that are old enough to appreciate these animals and to, uh, to help me raise them and sometimes even breed them. We've raised these and a few other species that we like the best. One of the things that I love about rosy boas is just how variable they are. You can see just this color cross section. And I like the colors that come in nature. I like the natural coloration. You can see one albino animal here, but I thought it would be useful just to kind of go through some of the localities that these animals come from and describe some of the characteristics that go along with those localities. So just to be a contrarian, I like the opposite look from Clint. So Clint loves that crisp line in the uh, the Mexican rosies or now the three lined rosies. I like that too. I, I, I love the Mexican rosies, but my favorite is this mottled look. This mottled look is characteristic of the first kind of suite of localities that I'll talk to you about here. That's the coastal rosy boa. You see that the coastal rosy boa, which is right now recognized as Licanura or cut eye, is a very mottled animal. So the stripes are there, but the side stripes especially are very mottled, you'll see. And you'll see there's a lot of, of the pink or orange coloration mixed in with those stripes from the top to the side. Much more mottled. Oftentimes, some of the brightest colored animals come from these coastal populations. This is a San Gabriel mountain locality, rosy boa. Again, both coastal animals. And this is an Anza Borrego rosy boa. This is, this is a, a, a hypo, so it's lacking the black pigment, but still the same look in the, the wild type with this uh, mottled look to it. So the, the coastal rosy boas are pretty distinctive from the rest of the localities. And like, like I mentioned, there are several localities within the coastal ranges, but these animals uh, also are exposed to more rain. There's, there's a higher amount of precipitation in a lot of the coastal areas. They may be a little bit more tolerant of humidity, but generally speaking, as Clint mentioned, rosy boas like it dry. Moving from the coastal areas of California, we move into the California desert and then into the Arizona desert. Very dry ranges on the other side of those coastal ranges. These two animals are Arizona animals. You see that they have the characteristics that the California desert rosy boas have. And in fact, they used to be recognized as the same species, a different subspecies from the coastal uh, gracia. That, under current thinking, although there's some, some disagreement out there on this, uh, has been sunken. And currently, these are still Licanura or Cudi, but you see very morphologically distinct from the coastal boas. Uh, depending on where you find these animals, from California into Arizona, those stripes can be chocolate. They can be more orange or rusty. Of course, this animal is not natural. This is a Harquahala range locality from Arizona, and that range uh, typically would have been more similar to this animal, this Hualapai mountain locality, rosy boa, chocolate or dark brown with those cream or darker, maybe khaki stripes in between. But the characteristic that really distinguishes these from the coastal animals is that they're much more clean. Those stripes are a lot more distinct than what you'll see in the coastal animals. Lastly, you see here the Arizona or the three-lined boa. Current common names usually have everything else we've talked about as rosy boas and these being three-lined boas, but common names are largely worthless. This is Licanura trivergata. The Mexican or three-lined boa, as Clint described, is probably the most contrasty of all of the localities. This animal is from Southern Arizona along the border, close to the Oregon Pipe National Park. 
they run from Arizona all the way into Mexico and really all the way down to the tip of Baja. So you'll see within the Mexican rosy boas quite a lot of variation in terms of the background color and the, the stripes, but generally speaking, you're gonna still see that high contrast, lots of them being very dark chocolate brown, almost black and light cream like this animal here. But some of the localities, especially in Baja, can be the same light background, but with stripes that are very bright orange or different colors. So that they can be somewhat variable even within that species. So as you can tell, I, I really love these animals. I think that they are one of the easiest animals. In fact, I recommend them typically to beginners uh, as an animal that they can work with, uh, especially when they're out and they're accustomed to you, not as a feeding mechanism only, but they are, in my experience, very docile. As you can see, very slow moving, easy to handle, easy to feed. They, they take domesticated mice without any problem, typically. In my experience with these animals, I've only seen them bite as a feeding response, and even then, not very commonly. I've uh, observed these animals, as I mentioned earlier in the wild, and of a couple, few dozen that I've found in the wild, I've never had one attempt to bite me, which confirms to me the fact that their response really is just a feeding response and it's something that uh, can be avoided uh, with the proper care. Thank you so much, Matt. That was incredible. When it comes to upfront costs, we give the rosy boa a score of five out of five. Rosy boas in a diversity of localities and morphs are available at fairly reasonable prices. This is possibly because they're relatively easy to breed and are not that popular for some reason. The enclosure is one of the least expensive you can get. You're gonna need substrate, a water bowl, hides, a heat source, a thermostat. Mm, that might be it. You might wanna get a wine chiller, but that's really the only thing that could change this score. And this is why overall we give the rosy boa a score of 4.4 4 out of 5. Rosy boas have somehow flown under the radar in our hobby. Especially if you like to keep your home a little bit on the cooler side, this is just an amazing pet snake. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you guys. I came into today really enthusiastic about rosy boas, but feeling like I probably don't need my own rosy boa. Now I could see myself needing to have like all of the rosy boas. It's, it's, it's bad. It's bad. Well, we will see where I am a year from now, but this is an incredible pet snake. I would say in a lot of ways for a lot of people, especially if your home is a little bit cooler, this, this could easily be the best pet snake there is. They're awesome. If what you want is a beautiful, reasonably sized snake that's easy to handle and has a derpy goofball face, then what you probably want is a sand boa or a hognose snake. But if you want all of that, but with a rad boa head instead of a silly face, then the rosy boa might be the perfect pet snake for you. As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. Unbeknownst and known to awesome. me. Is that a word? Is that That's correct totally message? Gotta you gotta get me to the next slide. <laughs> Bonus points if you caught that one, by the way. I'm having a good day. Look at these cute babies. Thank you so much, Matt. That was incredible. I'm going out on a limb there. I'll have to re-record that, that if it's not. <laughs> Here, just in case. That Matt, crazy. that was the worst. <laughs> Matt, that was adequate. I appreciate your adequate explanation of those morphs. And thanks for coming. Get out. Get out. What was that? I like the shade of the, on the uh, sand bow there. <laughs> yeah. I have a sandbar. I like him. It's a goofy face.